You probably knew that it's easy to sprout an avocado seed in a glass of water on your kitchen counter. But who knew that an avocado seed could provide fascination and wonder for 100 days in a row? In this episode of The Nature Journal Show, I interview Kate Rudder and learn how she has been nature journaling a sprouting avocado seed every single day for the last 78 days. Be sure to stay tuned to the end where she drops some wisdom that applies to all aspects of nature journaling. Hi, Kate. How are you doing today? Hi, Marley. It's so good to see you. Yeah, likewise. So you've been doing a really, really interesting project uh, nature journaling wise. Could you tell us how you got started with this whole avocado pit project? Yes. So I'm doing a project called 100 Days of an Avocado Pit, and it was inspired uh, by the Earth Day Challenge on the Nature Journaling Facebook group. And Jack Laws, who was one of the pioneers in that space, was like, find something every day and watch it until it reveals your secrets. Now, this was right as the pandemic um, was starting to take hold, and I was struggling to find some places to sketch and kind of connecting to sketching. Uh, there was a lot of stress and change. And so um, I really took up that challenge and thought this is a time to fall into kind of the beauty of the micro, you know, the micro observations. Uh -huh. uh, so I set it up interestingly and, and something that's affected it more than I'd expected is I set it up as a hundred day challenge and did a little bit of planning around constraints because I would say consistency is not my strong point. Uh -huh. um, and so uh, I, I did a little bit of planning that turned out to yield like just benefits all, all the way so far on the project on day 76. Mm -hmm. So over the, the halfway point and it has just been filled with unexpected magic and beauty and you know exploration. It's just been kind of weirdly fabulous. Wow, that's so cool. Could you show us um, your your pet avocado pit first? I will. So this is Little Pit. Little Pit was originally Little Pit and had a sibling Big Pit, but Big Pit, pit didn't germinate, so we uh -huh. go with Little Pit. And Little Pit has a main shoot, and uh -huh. then it's a little funky today because due to phototropism, I, I turn the oh, I turn right. it day so that it bends back and forth and strengthens the shoot. But right now it's kind of snuggled up. Uh -huh. but this is Little Pit and the main observational area, it's kind of hard with the reflection, but the main observational area is this kind of cut, if you will, in the, yeah. in the pit. Right there, uh -huh. that's a little better. And then, oh my goodness, have I fallen in love with roots. We never uh -huh. get to see the roots of a, wow. of a life form and they're, they're just beautiful. That is so cool. And then what is, how have you been journaling this? Yeah, so I do an index card each day. Uh -huh. And one of the constraints that I wanted is I wanted to have it set up because I knew a daily practice. I wouldn't be able to like wrestle all my things together. Like many nature journalers, I have multiple sketchbooks and palettes, mm -hmm. etc. And so my kit, which is the mini pit kit, um, is a tiny palette that I made out mm -hmm. of a eye um, shadow box. Mm -hmm. It only has three colors in it, four mm -hmm. colors in it. So it has just the primaries and then a neutral. Uh, so all the colors I've been doing have been mixed, which is its own learning. And then the rest of it mm -hmm. kind of, it's all in a tray and it just uh -huh. sits in my dining room table. Uh -huh. And it has things like my, all the tools I need, which are not that yeah. many. Uh, ruler, index, blank index cards, a water brush, and a pencil, a mechanical pencil, an eraser, um, and that's pretty much it. The, and then the sock, you know, so that you yeah. can use a water brush effectively. Three things I've added since the beginning um, that really helped was a flashlight so that I can oh. really look at certain areas. Huh. And then I started out when the movements and changes weren't that big with the helping hands. It's kind of uh -huh. like, a, you know, you can kind of look through a little uh -huh. bit. Yeah. But as the growth has become more subtle, um, I moved to a 30x jeweler's loop. Uh -huh. So I use this. And I, I set Little Pit up on, a, on a, um, another vase, actually, so that I can really uh -huh. get close. Yeah. And that's what I do. So the results 
are a series of cards. And right now, I think the latest count is 180. I do two cards a day. Yeah. Um, and so each one is an index card. And the very first one I'll show you is look like this. You know, not a lot going on. Right. And then the latest one, which is day 76, um, much more like this. Wow. So each, yeah, each day I try and do um, the same form factor. So mm. I didn't realize I was doing that. It was more of a matter of convenience. But what huh. you get over time is much more awareness around comparisons. And you can do more direct, I could do more direct comparisons. So for example, huh. this is like day 48 which is the same kind of form factor as this one, a little bit, you know, I kind of moved it down on the, on the card so I'd have a little more upper room when I needed it. Uh -huh. But ultimately you can like do almost a direct comparison. Right. Of those. And that's turned out to be super helpful. Okay. Could you explain what form factor is? Yeah, it's how big the something is and the uh -huh. shape of it. Got it. So you might have like an eight and a half by 11 sheet or you might do it landscape, you know, which uh -huh. is long and thin or portrait. But the, the constraint of the index card has turned out to be really meaningful and really helpful. Mm -hmm. okay. They're not awesome for like visual beauty, right. which also is helpful. Yeah. Uh, but they're, you know, it keeps it from getting too overwhelming. Got it. So I've noticed that you've used the word constraint probably like 70 times so far in the conversation. Could you tell us a little bit more like why that is important or how you're using that and like what that means? Yeah, great question. The um, Overall, I think I tend to have a pretty rambunctious nature journaling practice. Mm. So go out somewhere, look at what catches my eye and try and ask questions about it and use a sense of observation to connect with the wonder. Mm. Uh, I didn't feel like I would have the focus or the ability to do that or was it necessary in a pretty um directed project yeah uh, and so there's a lot of things i just didn't want to have to make decisions about mm. i didn't want to have to decide on page layout i didn't want to have to decide which sketchbook i didn't want to have to have like a pen because it worked with a journal that has a bit heavier tooth than a more smooth paper journal um, i didn't want to wonder whether or not to use uh like you know, a gel pen to bring out highlights. I just needed a very specific um, kit and I needed a specific way of, um, of materials so that the real interesting part was about the observation and about the capture. Mm -hmm. And what I learned by doing something um, fairly consistent is I didn't know I was being consistent. Like you start, I started out much more inventive. Like, I don't know how I'll capture this one thing. Like the first route map I did was mm -hmm. very, you know, I'm like, this is the interesting part. So I'll just draw that. I didn't know that that was becoming a series, but since then there's been like the second mm -hmm. route map and then the third and then the wow. fourth. And now when, now I have the, a, the ability, because I was fairly consistent, to start mm -hmm. to say, what's really going on here? What grew faster? Wow. What was the form of how the growth worked? Yeah, so I, I think that having, um, not having to make a bunch of decisions is what I mean when I say constraints. Right. There's a lot already figured out just with the format, and that allowed me to really focus on what's happening with Little Pit and why, and that was where the beauty came from. Wow, that's really powerful. Do you think that's something that applies to nature journaling in general? I think it can. I think there's times for, I don't know how this is going to go, like broad experimentation. Mm -hmm. I think there's times when things can be very gestural, like go with the moment. And I also think if there's something that's more of a, this is at least works for me, and I've seen it in others work, if there are things where you're comparing, Mm -hmm. then make it easy to compare. Use the same kind of layout or the same kind of size so that the real focus is not on understanding what, the, what I'm looking at, but instead what's different and what's the same. Wow. So those consistency, like if you're going to be exploring a landscape, you might have a kind of a size on a page that you just do the map there and then you do mm -hmm. a terrain and then you do a cutaway. You might use the same kind of layout for the same kind of information. And over a period of time, it turns out that you can look back and realize you've created a series mm -hmm. that might have greater learnings by just looking across those. I think there's a lot of magic and power in that. Mm, wow, that's really great. 
So that um, makes me wonder, you know, it seems like with, it seems like with your subject matter that there's this uh, potential to run out of ideas in some ways, or it seems that a lot of times for nature journaling or, or for other artistic pursuits, um, people are often looking for, always looking for like a new subject or an exciting subject, or we might be, our, our nature journaling um, excitement is very um, based on external factors or like finding, you know, like going to a park and like spending all day walking around looking for the right subject. So how do you, you know, with such a simple subject, how do you not like run out of ideas or, or get bored or, you know, how do you keep going with that? Sure. That is, that concerned me. And, and until I hit the first barrier, um, I, I was concerned about whether or not I could keep going. So a hundred days of just the blank avocado pit probably would have tried my patience. Yeah. I only have so, much. so I think if there's something that you're watching or nurturing and you're not sure if it's going to go anywhere, then like, let it start before uh -huh. you double down. Um, yeah. Cause I didn't want to have to say, well, here's a hundred pictures of the same kind of the same thing. Yeah. The other thing that was really surprising to me is uh, using it as such a lens to understand more about this world of avocados. Like mm. who knew? I didn't even know I was interested in avocados. I'd eaten mm. them, whatever, you know, but being kind of forced into exploring more about them on days when maybe there's not a lot of activity mm. uh, was interesting. And what it did is it opened up two things. One is look harder because maybe there's something I'm just not noticing. Mm -hmm. And then the other was, there's a whole history and culture around pretty much anything you might choose to nature journal. So mm -hmm. for example, um, like Joy, um, <clears throat> I think it's uh, Colin Jello from the Nature Journal Club, was like, mm -hmm. can you, you can make ink out of an avocado. Pit. Wow. And so she sent me a link and I looked it up and I, I made avocado ink and I, you know, wow. sometimes use it. Like I would have never done that. Yeah. So you can experiment and explore outside of the object, right? Like mm. I made an avocado mug cake mm -hmm. and <laughs> who knew avocados actually could taste pretty sweet if you put them in a mug cake. Yeah. Um, there are things like the historical implications of it. So, you know, where was the very, where's the oldest avocado mm -hmm. put down? Wow. A lot of this comes from research, but I was inspired of that research because I got to care for this and watch and nurture this growth happening like right in front of me. It was amazing. Yeah. Wow. So could you show some of your other pages where you did this outside research or brought in um, other information? Yeah. Uh, one of the things, this is a nice transition one. This was when Little Pit had just cracked open at the bottom and some people there's a big community of people who grow avocado pits recreationally uh -huh. so who knew the community was so uh vocal but they are and um there's a philosophy whether or not to remove the seed coat that's a little brown kind of papery wrapping uh -huh. if you remove it chances are you can see how the seed completely divides but i didn't uh -huh. so little pit kind of is hidden from half of it oh. turned out and so i so most of the early activity, I had to turn a little bit over and uh -huh. see what was going on. So I had that. And then I was able to do the research from the uh, California Avocado Society's yearbook from 1945, uh -huh. which shows the inside of it. So I was able to get the biology and associate yeah. that with what was happening. And other ones like that were um, like when nothing was happening, it turns out there's a whole phase of germination called the lag phase. Mm, wow. So I can make a card to diagram that so that I would better understand kind of the, the biological presence of what was happening. The same thing, like what does the inside of an avocado seed look like? What yeah. are the pieces and parts? And then things got more complicated. And one of my favorite stories that, that I didn't even expect but what I think is common in this practice is you see something, but you don't know why. Mm. And then when you learn why, it becomes exciting that you saw it. So when we, um, one of the first things that happened with Little Pit is that it had a radical, which is the name of a root, like mm -hmm. a, a early, very young root. And it grew super quickly. Like this is all within one day right? Like you can practically see it growing. And so I knew that was a big day. So I was measuring and growing at the time. 
But then I noticed over time, the very tip of the root had this whole galaxy of weird oh, wow. gunk around it. Yeah. And I'm like, is it healthy? Like, I, I don't grow plants. Oh. I don't have kids. I don't have pets. So I don't yeah. grow things. And so I'm like, is it dying? Are we okay oh. here? And it turns out later on, I learned that that root gunk is part of the root growth system. Wow. And it's sloughing off these cells as part mm -hmm. of the apical meristem for a root. Mm. So now I have a language and an understanding. And then that broader understanding allowed me to do things like this, which is mm. this is what the life cycle of at least an avocado root mm. looks like. And I've seen this emerge through the second generation roots and the third generation roots as well that I know what to expect and therefore I can kind of watch for it. And that just enhances the excitement of seeing it start to happen. Yeah. Wow. That is so cool. So it sounds like if you really dive into um, other research and looking deeper that you can't get, you can't run out of ideas basically. No. And also the other thing that happened was when you go public with something like this, mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, I went public for accountability. Mm -hmm. And to be completely honest, one of the reasons that I do two cards a day is because I post daily on Twitter, mm -hmm. but that I only post every 10 days on Facebook and on, um, on uh, the Nature Journal group. Mm -hmm. And so, because I don't want to spam people, but you know, Twitter is a daily thing. Mm -hmm. And it, when I post on Twitter, if you just do one image, it doesn't frame it very well. So I wanted two. Oh. So that really was a gift because it prompted and pushed me to have not just the observational moment, but also what else am I seeing or understanding? Mm. Uh, and then once you go public, members of your community start voicing in. Yeah. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, is Amy Weiser gave me this idea about the history of sloths, giant sloths mm -hmm. that helped populate avocados. Right. Without them, we wouldn't have avocados. Um, and then the ink from Joy. So mm -hmm. she also gave me a great quote. I've gotten links to movies and recipes and history. And, you know, everybody wants to be a part of it. People have shown me their ginger plants that they've grown, uh -huh. that they're growing and documenting. Yeah. A lot of people say they're doing an avocado pit. And they send pictures and we celebrate their growth. You know, it's kind of, yeah. who knew? This is not something I would have predicted in my life. Great. Well, I heard you mention ginger. Um, what are some other examples of things, similar things that people could nature journal at home in this way? Great idea uh, or great comment. I've seen ginger. I've seen avocados. I've seen bean sprouts. Mm -hmm. Maybe a lot of us have that from our childhood biology mm -hmm. experiments. Um, also, what was the other one? Someone was doing an orchid. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have an inadvertent pantry topiary of an onion. I think an onion could be mm. super interesting. Mm. I was committed, so I didn't get to do our, our onion. Um, I think that that one is good. I don't have a lot of green space, so I don't actually have a lot of places I could grow things, so we've kind mm. of limited it. But I would love to hear what the community has to say in the comments and what people have grown. Yeah, and it sounds to me like in a lot of ways, the limitation is actually the powerful part of this. You know, like I have tons of plants in my garden and I've nature journaled many of them, but I think there's something like the constraints and the focus and the limitation that actually is what turns this into such a powerful. And also the fact, you know, even though it's like on index cards and some people be like, oh, well, you that's not good for watercolor or whatever, but just like keeping it limited and all in the same kind of form seems like that's actually the key uh, in a lot of ways to how amazing this has turned out. So um, so um, another thing, you, you did share a little bit about um, some of your methods. Could you kind of, are there any other methods you think that are, are really important to make this work for someone who wanted to try this? Yeah, I... I'm happy to share methods. There's things that I rely on. So I try and do it every day around the same time of day. Okay. Uh, and that's moved a couple times, but consistency is important. I thought, I estimated it would take about 10, 15 minutes a day most. That's what I kind of planned for. Mm -hmm. I've gotten a lot more into it. I think it could take about 15 minutes, maybe 20 minutes if I really pushed it. But I spend a lot of time looking a little bit, trying to figure out what's happening and make assessments. Yeah takes me between 45 minutes and an hour a day 
which is a bigger commitment that I probably would have signed up for. So I think, I think it's okay to let yourself fall in love with it and then rearrange your life to accommodate the new obsession. Mm -hmm. um, I have, I have a little color tester. So when I mm -hmm. set up, I have the card, I'm looking at little pit and then I'm doing a drawing, usually look, then draw, look, then draw and compare. Uh, and then I'll do the color afterwards. Um, to keep the the size of the, um, hang on, let me get the latest one here. So to keep the size of the of the water jar the same, I built myself a little template with dots holes in it, and I use that I'm to mark good. that so that I know I'm in the same kind of size frame, so it doesn't yeah. float over time. That's turned out to be really handy and helpful. Mm. Uh, occasionally, I'll take a photo as a reference photo, and mm. that has also helped me kind of just remember when things happened. I, I usually have some past cards laid out so I know mm -hmm. where where we've been, um, where I've been. Yeah. Uh, and the the other thing that I started really early um, was to have a place at the bottom where mm -hmm. I put the metadata, which is mm -hmm. the date, uh, the year, the number of the card. I just thought they'd be like one, two, three, up to a hundred, but Turns out if I have multiple cards a day, I have one A, one B. The A is always observational and then like B or C. Sometimes I'll do four cards if it's a really crazy day. And then I always sign it with my nature journaling chop, my little initials. Uh, and over time I've had to change where that goes, but I always know it's there. And uh, when I photograph them and post them, I underline it. And then when I scan them every 10 days, I put a little arc over it so that I can keep track of all these things because like I said, there's 180 cards, and I sometimes yeah. sort and sift them out into different ways. Uh, let's see, I'm trying to think if there's... And that tray, could you show your tray again? I love how you just have everything on the tray. So then yeah. you, it's totally separate from your other nature journaling kit. You don't have to, like, pull stuff out of different drawers or bags or anything, right? Exactly. Yeah, let me kind of lean it down. Um, yeah. Usually my, uh, the, I go to... I leave it, and so I leave the little palette open so it has time to dry. Mm. Um, and one of the first things I did was to make a card so that in case I oh, needed awesome. to change anything, I, I knew what I had started out with. Awesome. For the longest project I'd done before was an Inktober, and um, I started, I did two of them. I did one the previous year, and I only got to about, I mean, the Inktober is 31 days in October of making an ink drawing. And I think I got to like 15 or 20. And I realized that there were there was just too much decision making. Um, and in order to really explore the 30 dayness of it, I guess, uh, I wanted to really focus on the purpose of that challenge, which was an ink drawing and not, what do I draw? How big is it? And that type of thing. <laughs> so I kind of started out with it. And then thinking about like 100 days, I'm like, ah, I need some way to figure out what pieces what I work with a lot of cards a lot of sticky notes in my professional life and I know things can get out of hand when they're not bound up in like a sequential book like a journal would be so I'm like I better number these uh -huh. um, and uh, that was really helpful and then over time I've added more structure occasionally I think I'm too constrained and I might just uh -huh. need to say mm -hmm. screw it I'm gonna do a completely different layout or explore uh -huh. it from a different perspective uh -huh. wow that is so cool um, the great thing with cards is that they're literally like cheap. Yeah. And, um, they're fast. And if something doesn't work, you can rip it up or hold it for another time or make notes on it. It's they're they don't absorb watercolor very well, but you know, if you're more interested in the observation and not the pretty picture, not a problem. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think just from looking at what I've seen online, I had no idea, maybe I hadn't read all of the text going along with your posts, but I had no idea you were doing on index cards. And I think it's very empowering or liberating for a lot of people who worry so much about like what kind of paper they're using. And, um, you know, you read these things that say like, oh, you need to, you know, if you only have a hundred dollars to spend on watercolors, spend like 70 on paper or whatever. So I, I just think it's really cool to show that, you know, it's possible to do some great nature journaling, including like wonderful color stuff on just index cards. So um, that, I think that's really cool. Do you have any other things like that you would um, say to like encourage people to try something like this or to motivate people at home? 
Um, yeah, I, I think say, look for something that is everyday and mundane, but that does have some change to it and just start. Uh, if there's one tool I wouldn't give up other than the capture, you know, than the actual supplies that, to make the piece, like the pencil and the, the watercolors, I would, mm. you know, a 30x jeweler's loop, like you just start looking and looking and you see so much more. And then you start realizing like things are poetic and beautiful and interesting, mm. even if they feel very mundane on the surface. And to me, that was one of that's one of the joys of nature journaling in general that I embrace is mm. the it's impossible not to appreciate and find beauty and wonder and solace and inspiration in just how magically bizarre and intriguing and interesting the world is. Mm. Right? So wow. you just find beauty everywhere. And then that I think infuses our life and wanting to create beauty for others too. So. Great. Well, that is such a poetic way to wrap this up. If people want to find out more or see some of your pages, where would you recommend that they go? Yes, I have um, a personal website where I post updates on it. That's Intelletto, I N is in Nancy, T E L L E T O dot com. Okay. And that's my general personal and professional site. Uh, mm -hmm. This specific project is on Tumblr at 100daysofavocado.tumblr.com. Great. Well, I'll put all of that in the video description also. And thank you so much. I can't wait to get this video to all the people out there who um, need some inspiring and encouraging ideas for what to nature journal. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure talking to you, Marley. Yeah. Thanks, Kate. If you got inspired by this video, thumbs up down below and subscribe to the channel. And if you can't wait all the way until next week for the next episode of the show, check out these two videos here.